Thank you for joining us for Still Speaking, a podcast from Ivanhoe Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. We are a United Church of Christ in Mundelein, Illinois, and an open and affirming congregation. This podcast aims to explore scripture through conversation with the purpose of discovering new insights and enhancing individual faith practices. God is still speaking, and we are all listening to discern a message for today and deepen our faith. This is podcast number two, Soul Investment. I'm Shelley Groh, joined by Pastor Chris of the Ivanhoe Congregational Church. If you're listening to this while you're out and about, thank you for joining us. If you happen to be in a place where you can sit and relax, please find a comfortable position and take a moment to release the stress of your day. We'll begin with a scripture reading. This one comes from Luke 12, 13 to 21. Chris, could you read it for us? Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, as in Jesus talked to this person, Friend, who set me to be a judge or an arbitrator over you? And Jesus said to all of them, Take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Okay, so in your words, what does the scripture mean? What does it mean to be rich toward God? I I think, um, I think it really goes back to one of the Ten Commandments about um, idolatrousness, you know, it's, it's what, what, whom do we worship? Do we worship a God who is loving and generous and therefore calls us to be loving and generous towards others? Or do we worship ourselves and what we've made and, and what will only allow us to relax, eat, drink, and be merry versus recognizing the concerns and needs of others? So it's about taking care of our community instead of just storing up for our own future and i think that's what most things that jesus teaches us boil down to about loving god and loving our neighbor and of course you know loving and taking care of ourselves. but once once we know we're taking care of ourselves, then how we care for others and how we put god above all of that so in this passage jesus does a thing that if i understand it correctly is um, when the person in the crowd came to him and asked him to tell his brother to divide the inheritance, that's a typical thing that somebody might go to a rabbi with and ask him to be an arbiter. And Jesus just stepped away from that position and said, you know, I'm I'm not going to play that role. Instead, I'm going to ask you to think a little bit more broadly about what your issue might be. And it's not just about your inheritance, but it's it's about how we all should be thinking about, um, you know, where we're placing our value. Yeah, I think... um if there was indeed some familial um, concern, you know, perhaps a, a local parish um, pastor, priest, rabbi would be able to sit down and, and mediate some conflict in the family. But this is Jesus, the the traveling rabbi, so he doesn't take the bait of being manipulated into uh, triangulation, right? And and sets it up as a situation for for the broader community um, where we're at at this situation um, or this context in Luke chapter 12, the beginning of chapter 12 says that there were perhaps thousands of people gathered around. So I have thousands of people coming to hear Jesus teach and preach and talk about love and the kingdom of God. And some guy pops up and, and says, Hey, Hey, you know, my concern is, is more important than all of these people's concern. Perhaps there is a little bit of, of this story being spun back to him and, and, um, and some greed. Perhaps it, it was um, a terrible situation, and and brother against brother, and um, but I think the 
we don't really hear of the pastoral concern. We hear more of the prophetic situation where Jesus is is pointing to um, to having a concern for others rather than only for ourselves. Right. Isn't it prudent to save for the future? Yes. Um, so in terms of our our personal context, I would never tell anybody to read the scripture and then, you know, sell all you have, give the money to the poor and, and come follow me. I, you know, I'm not Jesus. That's, that's not my role. Um, but I think Jesus is speaking to a, a conscious concern of, of worry and anxiety. Those are the scriptures that become immediately before this one and immediately following is, is about worry, is about anxiety. And I think that's what really robs us of our joy. So here's the question for you. I've read this great quote that, that advises us that the opposite of joy is not unhappiness. So we usually think of joy as being happy. The opposite of joy is not unhappiness, but anxiety. What do you think about that? I think that's absolutely spot on. Because if we're always worrying, we're always anxious. We can yeah. never find any any joy. We, we can't be content with a situation. We can't be in the moment with our families, with our friends, we, we can never be in a moment because we're always worried and dreading about what's going to happen next. So if we can take care of ourselves and our family, put some money away for our retirement, you know, pay all of our bills. Um, but if we're doing that at a risk of, of participating in the community, which Jesus calls participating in the, in building of the kingdom of God, then we're, we're robbing, you know, the community of, of our full participation. So, um, you know, you can look at it wherever your stewardship, um, family life budget is, um, you know, God in, uh, the 10 commandments calls us to, to give one seventh of our time, one, one day to honor the Sabbath and to honor God. Other scripture speaks about a tithe or 10%. I mean, that's, that's still allowing the majority to take care of, of you, and yours, um, but but what can you give towards others? I, I don't want to tell anybody what a what a number is, but I think it should be of value, significant. What what you think you can do um, with your time, with your talent, and with your treasure. The the scripture ends with the treasure. It gets picked up at the end of, of chapter twelve. Um, for where your where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And and heart in biblical times is really about faith, where you where you put what's most important, where you what you love and and we're called of course to love God the most and our neighbor as ourselves. There's so much in what you just said. Um so I'm going to try to piece it apart a little sure. bit. One of those is where you put your time and mm-hmm. there's a really interesting exercise um where you can just sit down and journal for a little bit about everything that you did for the past week and then just take a look back at it and say okay so what of these things were in service of god and and then you know without being too harsh on yourself just you know openly analyze that and then make a plan for the next week ahead you know whether it's just looking at the seven days ahead and saying okay well how could i make time in each of those seven days whether it's volunteering a little bit or calling on a friend or a neighbor who um, you need to check in on or that type of a thing. Um, I think that that's just a a simple way to kind of analyze where you have been placing value and how to be a little bit more intentional about it. I, I think that's lovely. I, I've read of similar activities uh, that invite you to um, have a gratitude journal because I mm. that's really where um, stewardship um the use of our resources and, and how we use that here at the church or, or whichever spiritual community or, or charities, good uh, agencies that you want to support. It, I think it always begins with gratitude. We give thanks for what, what God has given to us. I don't never want anybody to feel um, like a fingers being wagged at them and they're being told to do more because that that's not what I see um, my pastoral or, or preaching role. Because stewardship, that, that acknowledgement, a steward is like the manager of the store. You don't own the business. You're the manager. And, and to be a steward acknowledges, first and foremost, from a faith perspective, that our lives are not our own, that, that God has given us the gift of our life and new life that we know in Jesus Christ and the gift of our community and, and our callings and our careers and our possessions. And then how do we use those to, to honor God and to share love 
and, and find joy in our lives. That's wonderful. Um, I always, it just as you're talking, I just want to pause and let it soak in a little bit before we um, continue on because there's, um, a, I think, a lot to think about in, in each of those so concepts. Tell me, tell me, how did you, did you hear the scripture as a, as a wagging finger does it? Um, nobody wants to be called a fool, right? I think that's a terrible insult. You fool. Um, so I think I would begin there. How how does someone receive that scripture spoken by Jesus, but in the practical moment spoken, you know, from my voice to that? Yeah, I mean, it, it takes you off guard, right? It's a it's a slap in the face. It's a it's a take a deep breath. It's um, how do you hear it? For me, it was a little bit of okay. So what is enough, right? Okay. Like understanding that this was a lesson being told and taking it into modern day. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we're not a burden on other people if we have the means to be able to put a little bit aside for retirement to be able to, you know, ensure that we're not a burden on society, we should do that. But then we also um, should be thinking about how we're taking care of others in the community, volunteering, giving back that type of a thing. So like, what's, what's the right balance? That was one thought train that I was going down. Um, And then another one was the concept of distractions, which which we've talked about in our first podcast. And the thought there was that possessions are one distraction or vice or um, focus of worry to the point that you said earlier, but there are others too. So other ways that people try to um, soothe themselves or, um, you know, avoid other negative, you know, aspects of life could be television, it could be food or wine, it could be, um, you know, there are any number of vices or distractions, and one of them is possessions. And so I think that it's something that everybody should consider is what is the right amount of being able to dress appropriately to be acceptable in society and be able to get an audience to be able to be a role model for others, etc, without being in excess. And I think it's that level of excess that came through here to say, you know, first of all, if you have these huge barns with grain in them, what of that will spoil? And then it's not good for anybody, right. yourself in the future or anybody else. And certainly there will be good years in the future where you'll be able to grow more food. So understanding um, what you can share in balance with what to store. So I want to ask you if, um, if I paraphrase this verse does it sound like something from a scary movie? So right after God says to the rich fool, so that's actually the the name, um, the paraphrase of this story is the rich fool. So you start with that, you fool. God says, uh, this very night your life is being demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So that's the way that I read it. The original Greek says, this very night your soul, they demand from you. And the they as a pronoun refers back, the only antecedent is is the barn and the stuff. So you fool, your barn and your stuff is demanding your soul. So you can imagine a Stephen King movie about this story and all of a sudden the, the shade on the window goes goes down and back up as if the house is winking and then the silo that he wanted to tear down to build a bigger one becomes an arm and, and it reaches out for the man and then the barn doors swing open like a mouth and it, and it swallows him up. So you're speaking to distractions and, and of course there, there would be, you know, concerns for anybody with, with real addictions, but, but if we can be, um, self-reflective and see those distractions or see the, the points where, where they become an obsession and something that truly separates us from, from our community, our, our friends, our family, our, our faith life, you know, that's the definition of, of sin is when something separates us. The, mm-hmm. the Greek work goes back to an archery term that says we miss the mark. And, and so often in life, we try to improve ourselves. We try to be the best person we can be. And we miss the mark and we acknowledge that and we want to do better. We want to be a better person. But when we miss the mark in our faith life, it, it separates us from the fullness of life that, that God wants us to have. The, and I think that's what Jesus was trying to teach, that there are things that will distract us, will separate us, and, and we want to be better people. We want to find the fullness of life that he came to bring. And, and that's where true joy is found. 
Thank you for that. Um, I, it's an incredibly interesting passage. I think that there is a lot of layer to it that can continue to be explored. And I'm hopeful that in thinking about this throughout the week and listening to this, that others will have the opportunity to kind of delve into the layers of the passage as well. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add as a summary? So I, I thought uh, in this uh, summer season, we might go go camping and I ask which tent you want to live in. Will it be discontent or contentment? Um, and, and you and you alone determine which tent will be yours. You can choose it in large part by deciding what your life is about. If you decide that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, then you might choose to find contentment. And that means that we look to God as our source and we give thanks for what we have and we ask God to give us the right perspective on money and possessions and to change our hearts. If we decide to live simpler lives, wasting less and conserving more and choosing to give more generously. And when we do these things, we're claiming the joy of contentment and simplicity. A few years ago, we shared this prayer and I, and I think it's an, a nice, simple one to ponder this week. Lord, help me to be grateful for what I have, to remember that I don't need most of what I want, and that joy is found in simplicity and generosity. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, listeners, for joining us for this podcast from Ivanhoe Congregational Church. We are a 19th century church founded in 1838, but we want to be relevant for the 21st century. This podcast is one attempt at outreach. We hope you'll join us for worship in Mundelein, Illinois on any Sunday morning at 10 a.m. where you can be part of our gathered community. We aim to offer a warm welcome and a meaningful message. We also welcome your feedback. You can find us on Facebook or visit our website at ivanhoechurch.org. That's I-V-A-N-H-O-E church.org. Blessings to you with grace and peace.